A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. The basic definition of a civil war is a war in which two or more factions within a country enter into an armed conflict with each other. Such was what happened during a sudden four year long period in which the United States of America couldn't have been more divided. The American Civil War was undoubtedly some of the darkest days in US history. Simply, it was a war of secession between northern and southern states fought mostly over the right to own chattel slaves and the morality of slavery itself. In the end, the South, or the Confederacy, lost, and was reintegrated back into the US. But in this new series, I'll be exploring a hypothetical world in which the South comes out victorious and the Confederate States gains full independence from the Union. But as always, we need some historical context. The North-South divide in the US was always a controversial topic and really began to show up in 1804, when the Northern States abolished slavery and began taking measures to slowly phase out the institution completely. The southern states, who were mostly reliant on agriculture and slave labor, viewed this new abolitionism as a threat. The compromise for this issue was to maintain a balance between free and slave states. This meant that with every new state that entered the Union, the federal government had to walk an extremely controversial tightrope in order to keep both southerners and northerners happy. As expected, the north-south divide was nowhere near sustainable. The presidents that came after the Mexican-American War, especially James Buchanan, instituted a series of compromises which failed miserably. Slowly, the southern slave states began to loosen themselves from the federal government, and many southern plantation owners began showing more loyalty to their respective states than the Union. By the end of the 1850s, with tensions at their highest, the US was one massive powder keg about to explode. In the election of 1860, four different candidates ran them being Stephen Douglas, John Bell, John Breckinridge, and a new up-and-coming politician, lawyer, writer, and boxer from the Republican Party called Abraham Lincoln. Many Southern slave owners thought that Lincoln's campaign promises and general ideology was way too radical, and most of them feared that he would abolish slavery in the U.S. once and for all, an idea which the agriculture-dependent South wasn't too fond of, resulting in Lincoln's name not even showing up on the ballots of most of the Southern states. Despite this, Lincoln still won by a lot. This victory was not taken lightly at all. Having enough, 11 southern states all seceded from the Union, starting with South Carolina, and then later Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Tennessee, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas. These 11 states then banded together to form the Confederate States of America, with Richmond as their capital. The only slave states which stayed in the Union were Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri. The real trigger of the war happened on the 12th of April, 1861, when Confederate forces opened fire on the US-controlled Fort Sumter in Charleston Bay, resulting in Lincoln officially declaring war. The Union also placed a blockade on the South in order to starve their economy and their people. The first battle of the war took place in Bull Run. From the beginning of the war, it was very clear that Britain and France were ready to openly support the Confederacy. On November 8th, 1861, US Navy officers captured two Confederate diplomats aboard a British mail ship. Throughout 1862 and 63, famous and decisive battles took place at Shiloh, Antietam, Gettysburg, and Vicksburg. Also in 1863, President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, granting freedom to all African American chattel slaves. That June, a brand new state, West Virginia, carved themselves out of Virginia and rejoined the Union due to their pro North loyalties. By 1864, Southern troops were nearing Washington, D.C. However, this didn't stop Lincoln from winning re-election against Democrat George B. McClellan. After the election, everything went downhill for the Confederacy. The Union began a push for the sea campaign, and in no time, Atlanta and later most of Georgia fell back under U.S. control by December of 1864. On January 31st, 1865, Congress passed the 13th Amendment, officially banning slavery in the U.S. All of South Carolina was overrun in a couple of months, 
and later, by April, the Confederate capital in Richmond was captured by the Union. On April the 9th, 1865, Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered to General Grant, ending the Civil War in a Northern Union victory. Celebrations erupted all over Washington, D.C. This celebration, however, wouldn't last long, as just five days after Lee's surrender, President Lincoln was shot by Maryland actor and Confederate sympathizer John Wilkes Booth at Ford's Theatre. The nation grieved for the loss of Lincoln, as VP and Southerner Andrew Johnson was quickly sworn in as president. Meanwhile, former Confederate President Jefferson Davis went on the run, but soon more and more Confederate troops across the South began to surrender, and Davis, seeing the writing on the wall, finally dissolved the Confederate states. Davis would be arrested and jailed soon after. Now it was President Johnson's job to manage Southern Reconstruction, which was already proving to be a very tedious process as the Republicans in Congress were split on how to deal with the Southern states and the newly freed slaves in them. The Radicals aimed to completely punish the South and give freed African Americans full civil rights, while the Moderates believed that while African American rights were important, the South needed to be reintegrated into the US through compromise. In the midst of Southern Reconstruction, the 14th and 15th Amendments were passed, declaring equal rights for all U.S. citizens, as well as giving African-American men the right to vote. White Southerners, and especially former plantation owners, did not like these new laws at all, and organizations like the infamous Ku Klux Klan were founded to make sure that these new African-American rights were hindered as much as possible. It was only until 1870, under the presidency of former Union General Ulysses S. Grant, that the KKK was labeled a terrorist organization and disbanded a year later in 1871. Reconstruction officially ended in 1877, and the U.S. returned to a state of normalcy. So does this mean that racism has now been eradicated from the U.S., and we now all live in an equal society? No, absolutely not. Throughout the late 1800s and early 1900s, post-Civil War nostalgia was rampant in the South. This nostalgia gave rise to various groups like the Lost Causes and the Neo-Confederates. In 1915, a film came out called The Birth of a Nation, glorifying the first KKK and its intentions. The film led to the re-establishment of the KKK. Jim Crow laws were still extremely prevalent in Southern states, and African Americans were still severely segregated up until the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Yes. 1964, nearly a hundred years after the end of the Civil War. Today, while some progress has clearly been made, racism is still commonplace in the US. Many neighborhoods are still segregated, the KKK still exists, many Southerners still use the Confederate flag claiming it's a symbol of heritage, and Mississippi didn't remove the Confederate flag off their state flag until as recent as 2021. But what if all of this was different? What if, instead of the Union winning the Civil War, the Confederacy came out victorious and managed to gain their independence? There are a few points of divergence I'll be using, so let's go through them. Firstly, we have the Trent Affair. In our universe, despite the fact that the Union now had hold of two Confederate diplomats, they were eventually released. In this alternate timeline, let's imagine the Union doesn't release them, thus causing the British to give full support to the Confederacy. Secondly, the Confederate army under Robert E. Lee would need to win at the Battle of Antietam, allowing Washington, D.C. to come under siege and eventually get captured. For the third point of divergence, Abraham Lincoln would need to lose the election of 1864, meaning that the Democrat George B. McClellan, who wanted the war to end quickly, would become president. Those are the points where history changes. Also, just like last year, I'll narrate the scenarios if it actually happened. Here we go. The 1860 election was the last election held in the U.S. as a unified nation. By this point, tensions between the pro-slavery South and the anti-slavery North had reached a breaking point. One of the candidates of the election, up-and-coming Republican politician Abraham Lincoln, was proving to be very unpopular among Southern slave owners due to his abolitionist biases. As a result, his name didn't even show up in the ballot in many Southern states. This didn't stop Lincoln from winning the election anyway. The South was outraged. In December of 1860, South Carolina became the first state to secede, and over the next few months, 10 other Southern states would soon follow. These states would then unite to form the Confederate States of America with its capital in Richmond and Southern Democrat Jefferson Davis of Mississippi as their first president. 
On April 12th, the Confederate States attacked Fort Sumter, beginning the War of Secession between the North and the South. Up until November of 1861, the North and the South were on a pretty equal level. That was until the Trent Affair, when the US Navy captured two Confederate diplomats aboard a British ship. These two diplomats were not released from Union custody, angering the British, who would eventually side with and give full support to the Confederacy. France would soon follow. This would prove to be a very major problem for the United States down the line. Thanks to this new support, as well as good tactics, the Confederate Army under Robert E. Lee came out victorious at the Battle of Antietam in September of 1862. The South also won at the Battle of Gettysburg. By 1863, Lee's army began to draw nearer to the US capital. On August the 4th, 1864, Confederate forces finally marched on Washington, capturing the Capitol building and the White House. Abraham Lincoln and most of the Congress had already evacuated the city days before and set up a temporary government in Philadelphia. The rest of the Northern public was outraged at the Lincoln administration for this, and US morale dropped significantly. George McClellan crushed Lincoln in the 1864 election and became president. One of McClellan's first acts as president was to call for an end to the War of Secession. On March 7th, 1865, General Ulysses S. Grant surrendered to General Robert E. Lee, ending the War of Secession in a Southern Confederate victory. In the Treaty of Washington, the North was forced to cede Kentucky and West Virginia to the South, as well as recognize Southern independence and pay war reparations. The treaty went into effect on March 30th. Meanwhile, former President Lincoln, disgraced and in shame, moved back to his home in Illinois. Ostracized by the rest of his country, he would eventually shoot himself in 1883, at the age of 74. It is said that errors don't define the rest of one's life. However, it is clear now that it shall be my errors that will end thine. February 13th, 1883. Only a week after the Treaty of Washington took effect, on April 6th, 1865, George McClellan was assassinated by a group of nationalists. George Pendleton, his VP, was then sworn in shortly after. In the aftermath of the war, many Southern abolitionists fled to the North and even Canada, while the streets of Richmond filled with the cheers of hundreds of people. Eventually, tensions on the continent simmered down, and the Confederacy, now fully recognized, began searching for allies, specifically in England and France, but also in their northern neighbor. Confederate Secretary of State Judah P. Benjamin was sent to the north to negotiate a potential Sequoia Compromise, allowing the territory of Sequoia autonomy within the Union. Unsurprisingly, the north declined. In 1865, the CS also made an agreement with the French to intervene in their war with Mexico in return for some northern Mexican territories. This agreement led to a declaration of war against the Mexican state. With Mexico fighting a two-front war, their supply line buckled, and they eventually surrendered on June 21st, 1867, with their country divided between the French and the Confederates soon after. The North, still remaining extremely spiteful of the Confederates, supposedly began secretly funding underground militias and resistance movements in Mexico for a long while after the end of the war. In 1868, both the US and the CS had elections back to back. In the Union, George Pendleton ran for re-election against Republican Charles Sumner. Sumner, a radical Republican, was a very unpleasant candidate for the presidency, at least in the eyes of the CS. Which is why they all went crazy when he actually won. Meanwhile in the South, President Davis had finished his one term, and it was time to choose someone else. One thing to note is that the CS presidential term system worked a little differently. A Confederate president could only serve one six-year term, while US presidents could serve up to two or more four-year-long terms, both consecutive and non-consecutive. By 1868, a new party had risen in the South, known as the New Whig Party. This new party would nominate Alexander Stevens as their presidential candidate, while the Southern Democrats chose former General Robert E. Lee. Lee won by a landslide, I mean, come on, what did you expect, and became the second president of the Confederacy. Up north, it had only been a few days into his term, and President Sumner was already making extremely charismatic and passionate speeches about an inevitable second war with the South. He filled his entire cabinet with radical Republicans. Radicals also began filling up many Republican seats in Congress. In 1870, the US government passed the Civil Rights Act, granting full, equal rights to African Americans living inside the United States. 
Along with the help of Union General Ulysses S. Grant, Sumner also began drawing up plans for how the U.S. was going to win the upcoming war with the Confederacy. C.S. President Lee noticed all of this very quickly, and began drawing up his own plans for a northward counterattack. Unfortunately for the South, however, President Lee then died of a debilitating stroke on October 12, 1870. He was then replaced by his VP, William Porcher Miles. Tensions between the two nations would only escalate in 1872, when the US would hold another election. The Confederate government hoped hard that Sumner would fail to win re-election against the Democrat Benjamin G. Brown. He did not. And it only even got worse from there. During his second inaugural address on March 4, 1873, President Sumner declared war on the Confederate States. A second war had officially begun, and Sumner plans to make the South pay for their treachery once and for all.